Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon or this morning, whenever you're watching this presentation. Uh, my name is Dr. Weston Umstead, and I am the Technology and Business Development Manager for Chiral Technologies, located in Westchester, Pennsylvania. I have a number of responsibilities here, one of which is the uh, method development screening and method development optimization process that uh, we'll talk a little bit about today, specifically for cannabinoids. Um, but I'm also responsible for a number of uh, preparative outsourced and insourced uh, separations projects, which um, we don't really cover those applications too much in today's presentation. But uh, certainly if that sounds like that's something that's interesting to you, I can, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you about those at some point, but I've been with Chiral Technologies for a little over five years now. Uh, started out doing some synthesis work on a uh, Definity Genomics project, which was uh, essentially just a PCR cleanup uh, affinity resin, and then moved into the uh, Chiral Core business, uh, which is the, the topic of conversation for today. Um, Dicell Chiral Technologies, uh, or Dicell Corporation as you might know it a little bit more, uh, broadly is the uh, leader, global leader in polysaccharide based chiral stationary phases. And so the, the topic today is going to be uh, a number of applications that have been developed using these phases, uh, both for achiral and uh, chiral separation of cannabinoids. So just a, a couple of bullet points here for, for what we're going to be covering today, the topics of interest. Um, for those of you who are joining us who might not be too familiar with chiral chromatography, I thought it would be a good place to start to uh, talk about a little bit of the history of, of chiral chromatography and, and why it is so important or what its other applications have been used for. Uh, but of course, the majority of what we're going to talk about is, is the cannabinoid separation. So post 2018 with the passage of the farm bill, what were sort of the initial applications that these uh, phases were used for? And then uh, more recently, as the, the field has expanded and a number of chiral cannabinoids have been identified, uh, what sort of applications these phases have been used for uh, for those types of separations. So let's start first with the, uh, the background. So as you may or may not know from your history books or from uh, Billy Joel or some other source, uh, thalidomide was sort of the uh, first case, if you will, where the uh, structure of the molecule was really uh, pinpointed as being important for its function in the body. Uh, so in the late 1950s and the early 60s, thalidomide was being prescribed to uh, pregnant mothers for uh, assisting with morning sickness. But as their children were being born, um, they were being born with some pretty severe birth defects. And so uh, sort of later on down the line, it was it was found that the R enantiomer, which is up on the screen as the left molecule, uh, was the therapeutic and the S enantiomer on the right was the um, the one that was causing the, the severe birth defects. But thalidomide wasn't necessarily the first case where this sort of chirality thing was noticed or was, uh, was noted as being important. There were a number of earlier accounts uh, sort of sharing the differences that were, were arising from natural structures. So uh, the French physicist Biot noticed that there was some optical activity in the structure of quartz. There was actually two different handedness uh, forms of the crystalline structure of quartz. Of course, you might be familiar with Louis Pasteur and his experiments with tartaric acid. Uh, Unfortunately, he had the task of separating them by hand. Uh, and today, it's much more convenient for the separation of these enantiomers. Um, historically, because of thalidomide and because of a number of other cases where the structure of a compound equaled some sort of a uh, physical uh, indication in the body, the pharmaceutical industry has been one of the greatest adapters and users of the chiral chromatography, the polysaccharide based chiral chromatography uh, products. It's estimated something like 80% of all drugs that are developed, uh, whether they are commercialized or not, it's a different story, but roughly 80% of the drugs 
that are considered for one indication or another contain some sort of a chiral center. So remembering back to uh, chemistry, high school chemistry days or uh, the dreaded organic chemistry days of uh, undergrad, uh, a chiral center, we're talking about a tetrahedral carbon, so a carbon that has four different things attached to it. Um, but carbon is not the only chiral center. Uh, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus can also be uh, chiral depending upon what substituents they have attached to them. Um, a lot of different cases in the literature that are pharmaceuticals, uh, things like non-steroidal and anti-inflammatory drugs, beta blockers, antidepressants, and many, many more. I uh, just have a, a few examples, uh, structures on the screen here. On the left-hand side is ACE butylol, which is a, a beta blocker. Uh, in the center is citalopram, which is an SSRI. And on the right-hand side is fluoxetine or Prozac, which is also an SSRI. Now I talked about the um, some of the, the services that are, I'm a part of here at Cairo Technologies, one of them being the uh, method development screening. There are a number of interactions that can take place between the chiral analyte and the chiral stationary phase. Uh, the chiral stationary phases that we're talking about are either cellulose or amylose based, and those cellulose and amylose polymers form a left-handed helical twist structure. Uh, and in doing so, they form what we like to call chiral grooves, and uh, think about DNA, double-stranded DNA, where the the groove is where a lot of the interaction can take place with outside um, compounds coming in. So left-handed helical twists, these chiral grooves, within them have what we call chiral selectors, and there's these small uh, phenyl groups, either phenyl carbamates or benzo benzoates, that can form a number of intermolecular interactions between the chiral stationary phase and the analyte. I summarized here in a table uh, some of the main uh, interaction, uh, interactive forces that take place between the chiral stationary phases and the analytes. The ones that we're most interested in usually are hydrogen bonding, steer kindrance, pi-pi interaction, and dipole-dipole. Generally speaking, the others take place but don't have as much of an influence on the actual separation of a compound. And the three-point interaction model shown to the right, uh, which is really a sort of a drug binding model, but it represents the point. What we look for is at least three points of interaction on the chiral stationary phase that line up with uh, functional groups that are on the active or the inactive enantiomer, or the enantiomer that is going to be more strongly retained or eluded earlier in the HPLC method. And so if there is a lining up of those functional groups with the points of interaction on the chiral stationary phase, the opposite enantiomer, although it has the same functional groups, as you can see in the center of that right figure, the inactive enantiomer, they don't line up as well with the points of interaction on the chiral stationary phase. So there is a difference in energy that takes place between active and inactive, and we hope that there is enough of an energy difference that eventually propagates into a chiral separation. And even if you were to take that inactive enantiomer and rotate it, there's still not a matchup of those points of interaction. So still enough of an energy difference to see a separation um, of the of the enantiomers. In reality, it's a lot more complicated than that because you have to consider everything is solvated by mobile phase. Uh, if you have a polar organic solvent present like ethanol or methanol, there's certainly going to be blocking or promoting of certain interactions. So what we like to do is we start off with a method development screening, which allows us to check the chiral analyte on all of the different polysaccharide phases under a wide range of different mobile phase combinations. And that usually is sufficient enough then to help us find a chiral separation to be able to get, begin our method development process. Now for cannabinoids, uh, as I sort of laid the foundation in the introduction, cannabinoids initially post 2018 and the, the Farm Bill, uh, really the focus was on uh, quantifying or identifying the presence of or lack thereof of THC in CBD products. So the Farm Bill essentially legalized the regulated production of hemp and by extension the production of CBD or cannabidiol, 
which is a non-controlled substance according to the DEA. But it had the caveat, of course, that all CBD products needed to contain less than 0.3% of delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, delta-9 THC. So that was sort of the initial target application. And many of the uh, achiral phases that were available, uh, C18, for instance, were uh, widely known and cost-effective based on previous technologies that were established. And they worked well because CBD and THC are not chiral molecules of each other. Um, they are not structurally related. And so things like C18 or phenyl or amine or other commonly available uh, commercialized achiral phases work very well. And uh, probably know this very well. There's a number of application notes and papers and posters and so forth on this topic. Uh, those phases work really well and the methods have been um, integrated in a lot of different labs across the, the U.S. Now, interestingly enough, although I set the stage for chiral stationary phases and chiral separations, the chiral environment that's created by the left-handed twist of these polysaccharides is also capable of doing achiral separations as well, which makes them sort of dual purpose. They can do the later applications that I'll talk about, the chiral separations, but also these other applications here uh, that I'll show you earlier on for achiral separations. So early on, uh, the first applications that were developed were supercritical fluid chromatography based. That is a chromatography that uses supercritical CO2 as the primary mobile phase component. A lot of this was done uh, because of the green advantages. Uh, SFC technology, just like um, supercritical fluid extraction, uses a considerably less amount of organic solvent, and so the cost is generally lower and, of course, a, a little better for the environment in, in getting rid of the organic solvents. If you look at uh, the separation of this 10 cannabinoid mixture uh, that's commercially available from Cayman Chemical in Michigan on uh, immobilized cellulose tris 35 dimethylphenyl carbamate with 15% methanol as a modifier, you get a nice baseline resolution of uh, a, a number of different cannabinoids here, everything from CBD and delta-9 THC, which was the primary target, to uh, things like delta-8 THC, uh, CBG, CBN, and so forth. These um, also work really well under normal phase uh, high performance liquid chromatography conditions, although not as green. Uh, the separations are, are maintained when you move to uh, mixtures of things like hexane IPA or hexane ethanol. Uh, with the same chiral stationary phase that I showed in the last slide here, mobilized cellulose tris 35 dimethylphenyl carbamate with 96% hexane. 3% IPA and 1% ethanol, a little bit of TFA. Um, you get, again, the nice baseline resolution of that same 10 cannabinoid mixture. Now, the difference between SFC and HPLC, aside from the mobile phase components, is the fact that in this case, normal phase, you need to have an acidic additive. SFC is slightly acidic in its nature. The CO2 uh, will exist as um, a carbonic acid water CO2 mixture that you might be familiar with. So the carbonic acid is normally enough to take care of the acidic uh, cannabinoids like THCA. However, on normal phase, it's a relatively neutral mobile phase. And so you need to add something like uh, trifluoroacetic acid or formic acid usually to help improve the peak shape of the acidic cannabinoids. Uh, but in any case, the, the separation is maintained as you can see here. Uh, just another example, very similar mobile phase conditions. Uh, this is an, an immobilized amylose tris s alpha methyl benzyl carbamate, also commercially known as chiral pack IH. Uh, same separation of, of that 10 cannabinoid mixture. Now, this sort of sets the stage a little bit. Um, you'll notice the uh, second column over in the elution time, you see CBC, which is cannabichromine. I have listed there two different elution times. And that is because CBC is one of those few uh, cannabinoids that's actually racemic naturally occurring. And so under these methods, although they were sort of 
focused primarily on the achiral separations, we were actually seeing both the mixed chiral and achiral separations taking place, which sort of leads into the, uh, the applications at the end of this presentation. And then lastly, uh, reversed phase, high performance uh, or high, high performance liquid chromatography, water-based uh, mobile phases. Um, I would say it's sort of the, the mix between SFC and normal phase, a little bit greener in the fact that it's aqueous based, um, but of course you're still dealing with some organic solvent. Um, in this case, it is acetonitrile. This is a separation of that same mixture on immobilized amylose tris 3 chloro 5 methylphenylcarbamate with 45% uh, water and 55% acetonitrile. Again, because it's uh, not SFC, you do need the addition of the acidic additive just to help with the uh, acidic residues. Now, if we start looking a little bit more specifically at the chiral cannabis separations, I said I set the stage in the, the last separations that the, uh, the separation of CBC. So we can start there. Um, you see here that CBC happens to elute later in this um, uh, three chloro five methyl phenyl carbamate uh, immobilized amylose method. If we shift gears a little bit and, and do just a screening of it, we'll find some very interesting results that help us improve upon the retention that was sort of set forth in, in those other methods. As you may or may not know, uh, cannabichromine can undergo a UV uh, cyclization process whether it be naturally or as a result of, of storage conditions to cannabicyclol. I have the structure of both of those shown here, as sort of the UV uh, degradation process. Up in the left-hand corner, the structure of cannabichromine has the chiral center starred, it's alpha to the, uh, the oxygen in the uh, six-membered ring. And of course, when it goes and is cyclized, that uh, chiral center is not lost, it is maintained, and uh, you get the structure that is shown in the bottom right of the slide for the cannabicyclol. So if we mix these two things together, um, or on the right-hand side, cannabichromine by itself, and we do that sort of method development screening on immobilized cellulose tris 35 dimethylphenylcarbamate, it will roll off your tongue the more you say it, uh, with 97% hexane, 3% ethanol, um, you get a nice baseline resolution of CBC, and on the left-hand side, mix it in with the cannabicyclol, uh, a nice four-peak separation. Again, it's a chiral, mixed chiral, achiral separation as you're achieving uh, the separation of both things. And really, the side-by-side -side comparison here is to help um, show elution order. So the cannabicyclol is very well resolved coming out peak one and peak four and the cannabichromine is the third and uh, second and third peaks uh, respectively. If we start looking at uh, THC itself, uh, THC naturally occurs only as one enantiomer. However, it does have the potential to form both the plus and minus delta nine variant, um, more synthetically than naturally occurring, but nevertheless, it also has the same potential to develop the minus and plus enantiomers for the Delta-8 THC. Uh, Delta-8 THC now becoming quite popular in the, um, in the industry as a product that's, av as, that's available because it's not, uh, control it's not a controlled substance. So it's sort of a workaround for the DEA restrictions. But if we mix these four things together, again, this would be a mixed chiral, a chiral separation between Delta-8, Delta-9, a chiral and then plus minus chiral. We get a nice baseline resolution of all four enantiomers or four uh, isomers on amylose tris 3 chloro 4 methyl phenyl carbamate with 95% hexane and 5% IPA. Uh, again, these are all now non acidic um, cannabinoids, so there's no need for an acidic additive like we saw when we were dealing with THCA, A, for instance. Some of the other THC variants now also uh, occurring or, or showing up a little bit more frequently, Delta-6 THC and Delta-10 THC. Uh, really, it's, it's the longer names that I have shown on the uh, pictures here, but it's a little easier just to say Delta-6 and Delta-10 Delta for presentation purposes. But much like Delta-8 and Delta-9, it's a mixed chiral, achiral separation. 
between the chiral delta-6 and delta-10 separately and the achiral mixture together. We have a nice uh, baseline resolution for that under normal phase HPLC conditions. Uh, the immobilized cellulose tris 35 dimethylphenyl carbamate is, as you might have uh, gathered so far, a very useful chiral, separa uh, chiral stationary phase for these sorts of separations. It shows a very wide range of selectivity across the number of different cannabinoid mixtures. I can't necessarily call it a cannabinoid column, but it does a very good job at separating a lot of these different mixtures. Uh, but in any case here for delta-6 and delta-10, you see here um, sort of a, an interesting elution order where you've got the delta-6 variants coming out at 3, 4, peaks 3 and 4, and then the uh, delta-10 variants coming out at uh, peaks 1 and peaks 2. But if we go and we switch up the chiral stationary phase to uh, cellulose tris 3 chloro 5 methyl phenyl carbamate, uh, which is chiral pack IG, you get a little bit of the a shuffling of the elution order. So you get delta uh, 6 and delta, the, the two enantiomers of delta 6 coming out 1 and 2 now, and the two enantiomers of delta 10 coming out 3 and 4. Uh, I mentioned that only because uh, for preparative separations, it's it's always a good handle to be able to change elution order. Generally speaking, your peaks of interest you want to elute first. So should you want to adapt this to a preparative chiral separation, having the ability to mix or switch around the elution order is kind of important for that. Um, so where are we headed? Just a couple of closing remarks here. Where are we headed? Not surprisingly, I would say that um, as time goes on and the legal status of a lot of these different cannabinoids begins to evolve, that you're going to start to see a lot of additional regulation, uh, much like was the case early on with needing to quantify the percentage of uh, THC in CBD products. It would not surprise me if the regulation evolves to needing to measure the level of Delta-8 THC, for instance. Um, HHC, which is hexahydrocannabinol, uh, cannabidiol, has now become another workaround for the legal status of Delta-9 THC. Uh, we have a number of uh, applications that have been developed on, on the separations of HHC now as well, but having proper testing for that. Uh, the presence of opposite enantiomers might also become uh, something of interest. Uh, CBD, for instance, is not only commercially available, but it's also prescribed as a pharmaceutical. And so the need for characterizing the opposite enantiomer, much like was the case for thalidomide, uh, might also arise for CBD or any of the other cannabinoids that become uh, registered pharmaceuticals for different applications. And so the take home message for this presentation really is that chiral columns can, can do it all uh, as these sort of regulations do become more relevant or more prominent. Uh, achiral methods that don't separate out the enantiomers aren't going to be sufficient anymore. And so we have uh, hopefully started to lay the groundwork for those uh, those applications. A lot of what you have seen here is all nice, clean analytical standards. So uh, for us and sort of for application development, the next step is taking these and putting them into real world samples and kind of messing the samples up a little bit and complicating them and adding in other cannabinoids and things like that to see um, how exactly we can go about using these for, for accurate quantification and identification. Uh, if you like the information that you've heard today, um, if you want to reach out to me and, and have a, a broader discussion on chiral chromatography or a more specific one on these applications, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My email address is shown on the screen now, wolmstead at, at cti.dicel.com, or feel free to give me a call on my office phone, uh, extension 264. I would love to have a, a conversation with you about these and uh, other applications of chiral chromatography. So I appreciate it very much again for uh, your time and attention today, and I uh, look forward to discussing these with you more uh, in the near future. Thank you.